order. You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and it's it's Putin, it's the Trumps, and it's this nexus, um, you know, very international nexus of criminals and go-betweens and spies and blackmailers and others that they've had doing their dirty work for a very long time. You know, like I always trace this back to Roy Cohn, uh, you know, who was involved in so many of this country's most terrible crimes and atrocities and, you know, who served as a go-between in this fashion. You can amass quite a lot of power in that capacity. And so I guess this is the point in the show, like I sort of dread talking about this, but it's really important, where I want to talk about the new expose in the Miami Herald by Julie K. Brown about the uh, pedophile and sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein. A fantastic piece of in-depth reporting by the Miami Herald has revealed shocking new details about a 2008 plea deal that Alexander Acosta, then U.S. attorney in Miami, offered billionaire hedge fund manager and serial sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. Epstein was a money manager for the wealthiest elites in the country. He owned two private jets, the largest single residence in Manhattan, an island in the Caribbean, a ranch in New Mexico, and a waterfront estate in Florida. His friends include people like Donald Trump, Bill Clinton, and Britain's Duke of York, Prince Andrew. But behind the scenes, Epstein was running a horrific, pyramid-like underage sex scheme offering $200 to impoverished and troubled 14 to 17-year-old girls to come to his home and give him massages. Once they got there, he offered more money for increasingly vile and exploitative sexual acts and also paid them to recruit other young girls. An FBI investigation revealed what the Herald calls a sprawling network of victims and an abundance of physical evidence and witness testimony, including notepads seized from Epstein's home with some of the girls' names and phone numbers. The FBI had enough material to produce a 50-page indictment with federal sex crime charges that could have put Epstein in prison for life. So, what was his sentence? Unbelievably, this evil pedophile monster served just 13 months in a county jail for his crimes. And it gets worse. In those pathetic 13 months, Epstein's so-called cell was a private space in a vacant wing of the jail. And he was allowed out to work 12 hours a day, six days a week in his fancy office, despite the county sheriff's department rules explicitly forbidding sex offenders from qualifying for work release. Then, after his sentence, Epstein reportedly traveled extensively, even receiving permission to visit his private Caribbean island, an exceptional privilege for a felon on probation. So, how did Epstein get away with all this? That's where Alexandra Costa comes in. As the local US attorney, it was his job to prosecute the case. But Epstein had a powerful list of lawyers on his side, including Harvard professor Alan Dershowitz, former Whitewater independent counsel Kenneth Starr, and Jay Lefkowitz, who just happened to be Acosta's former co-worker at the well-known Washington law firm Kirkland & Ellis. So, Lefkowitz scheduled a meeting with his old colleague, Acosta, to discuss Epstein's case. They reportedly met for breakfast at the Marriott Hotel in West Palm Beach. As a result of that meeting, Lefkowitz walked away with an extraordinary plea deal that not only led to Epstein's outrageous 13-month jail sentence, but also included a non-prosecution agreement that effectively shut down an ongoing FBI probe into whether there were more victims of Epstein's depravity. The deal required Epstein to plead guilty to just two prostitution charges in state court. Beyond vastly understating his crimes, those charges are blatantly ridiculous given that his crimes were against minors who by law can't consent to sex and thus can't be prostitutes. Epstein was required to register as a sex offender and pay restitution to the three dozen victims identified by the FBI, but in exchange, he and four of his accomplices, whose identities are still hidden, received immunity from all federal criminal charges. And, as part of the arrangement, Acosta agreed that the deal would be kept secret from the victims who were calling for justice against Epstein. The Herald's investigation also found that Acosta and his team actually helped keep the case quiet. One email from Acosta's fellow prosecutor, Marie Villafana, to Epstein's lawyer read, quote, On an avoid-the-press note, 
I can file the charge in district court in Miami, which will hopefully cut the press coverage significantly. Do you want to check that out? What? It is absolutely shameful that Acosta and his team bent over backwards, not just to reduce Epstein's sentence to practically nothing, but to hush the whole thing up. Have you ever seen a more sickening example of the elite looking after its own? Quite rightly, a number of lawmakers are now calling for an investigation into all this by the Justice Department Inspector General. The Labour Secretary himself has refused to comment, but back in 2011, he did write a to whom it may concern letter in response to outrage over the deal. In it, he says, Our judgment in this case, based on the evidence known at the time, was that it was, a, it was better to have a billionaire serve time in jail, register as a sex offender and pay his victim's restitution, than risk a trial with a reduced likelihood of success. See what he did there? He's basically saying, guys, this is a billionaire we're talking about. You're lucky he got any punishment at all. What an outrage. He's admitting that there's one law for the rich and one for everyone else. That's not good enough, Alexander Acosta. You helped cover up a billionaire's pedophile sex crimes on an epic scale. Now you're in President Trump's cabinet. And I think you owe all of us an explanation and an apology. And if you can't do that, it's time for you to go. Who is linked closely to Trump. He is linked to people that have been defending Trump and working with Trump, especially Alan Dershowitz. And so uh, to review, you know, first of all, go and read this article if you can. Um, it's not a new story, you know, and this kind of reiterates what we're saying, that it's very frustrating to have these um, old stories of terrible people who go unpunished come up again and again. But it does have new information and especially uh, new firsthand accounts from the victims of Jeffrey Epstein and his crew of pedophile sex traffickers. He is a um, billionaire who hung out with a lot of famous people, um, you know, all of whom are implicated in this. Gawker a few years did an article about this, uh, listing the contents of his black book. Um, I suspect this is one of the reasons that Trump's backers, especially Peter Thiel, uh, went so hard against Gawker uh, to try to get that taken off, although, you know, the internet is forever. Uh, among the people that uh, associated with Epstein, Dean are Alan Dershowitz, uh, Donald Trump, uh, Bill Clinton, Prince Andrew, Ehud Barak. And so what he would do is lure underage girls to his mansion, molest them, rape them, and force these girls to service these guests who were brought in. And so this is not a theory. Um, you know, he was caught and he was ostensibly punished for it. But Epstein ultimately did little jail time. You know, he ended up serving a little over over a year. Uh, it was not a real sentence where he went to prison. It was a very cushy kind of house arrest thing uh, during which he did things like travel to the Virgin Islands. And this was because he was represented by Alan Dershowitz. And after Alex Acosta, who is the prosecutor in Florida, helped Dershowitz and helped the Epstein defense team cover this up and then afterwards got the federal government to seal the court documents. And so as the Miami Herald notes, uh, Acosta is now rewarded by Trump. He's the Secretary of Labor. And so why would they do this? Why would they go out of the way? Why would Trump feel compelled uh, to reward him? Well, one of the cases that was listed in the Epstein trial was about Trump raping a 13-year-old girl uh, allegedly provided by Epstein. When Epstein had to testify, when he was asked about Trump, uh, you know, and whether he was involved, he, he took the fifth. He didn't want to talk about it. In November of 2000, 2016, the case came up again when Lisa Bloom, the lawyer, decided to represent the 13-year-old victim, uh, you know, who's now an adult. This happened back in the 90s, and who had said Trump had raped her. Um, there's other serious uh, and disturbing claims in there about Trump making another young girl disappear. And she was going to have a press conference. I remember that day of waiting for these revelations to finally get the kind of attention that they needed. And of course, the victim was threatened. Lisa Bloom was threatened, and the entire press conference was dropped. So again, you see these tactics uh, that are used all over by this network. You know, the Kremlin uses them, uh, the Roy Cohn goon squad and its successors use them, Trump uses them, and, you know, Dershowitz is also involved here. Dershowitz is somebody who not only was representing Epstein, but was accused of raping a girl himself. Um, and that case was settled out of court. Uh, Dershowitz did 
denies it. But, um, you know, I'm kind of, I have questions. I also have questions about, you know, why is this guy still on CNN? Why is he being upheld, uh, you know, as this sort of legal vanguard by so many people after this? And so, yeah, I mean, I have more to say about this, as you know, but like, do you have any comments? Because <laughs> this is like a really long, depressing monologue. I think this is another one of those, it's so big, it's untouchable stories, just like, Trump and Russia colluded to steal the 2016 election. It's just, it's just so massive and damning and condemns a lot of people who are complicit in the process uh, that people have a hard time believing it. And I, I just want to tell our audience, if you see anybody on television or, or anybody in the New York Times, because they love to do this, interviewing Dershowitz, and treating him like a normal source and not pushing him relentlessly on these pedophile charges and being associated with pe like pedophilia and not making this the center of who Dershowitz is and who he chooses to surround himself with, then that is a failure of journalism. And they are therefore complicit in this. And it's just repeating the same lack of, I don't know, professional ethics that got us to this point where people are now finally catching up to Trump and Russia, where they uh, ignored it in 2016 and even debated it relentlessly and viciously in, um, th throughout the start of uh, 2017. So please, if you see anybody interviewing Dershowitz and not making the, the abuse of children, the story of how Dershowitz was allegedly part of a, a, a ring of powerful white men who traumatized little girls for life by treating them as sex slaves. If, if that's not the center of the discussion that that journalist is having with, with Dershowitz, please let us know. Please make that public. Please tag Gaslit Nation on Twitter because we need to I identify who is, who is uh, committing journalistic malpractice. Yeah, absolutely. And you may recall over the summer, there was this succession of articles about how, you know, Alan Dershowitz was feeling sad at the Hamptons and he didn't get to go to as many parties as normal. And I mean, it was just the most transparent whitewashing of this hideous man who is, you know, in addition to this, which is obviously, this is the worst thing um, he's been accused of doing. But, you know, there are other connections at hand. He was Julian Assange's lawyer. Uh, he's also implicated in a corruption case involving the Kushner family. Like, there are all sorts of relevant things to ask Alan Dershowitz about beyond his hurt feelings about being left out of some fancy party. So, yeah, people or, absolutely. Or where should. he thinks the Mueller probe is going. Why would you ask him yeah, that? Of course, he wants to downplay lie. everything. They are all going to lie. And, like, what this is exposing, I mean, the reason this, this case, it's like, I mean, it's a weird case because everyone knew about it. There's a book about it by James Patterson. It was covered by the press because these are court documents. This isn't some sort of Pizzagate scenario. Scenario, although that is obviously projection, you know, that that is a way for people to think, oh, that sounds like Pizzagate. It must not be true. This was real. This was all in court. You know, these this all happened in the public eye, not the actual rape acts. But uh, the discussion of them and the discussion of the trial was was all out there. But people are terrified of talking about it because it exposes these higher rungs of society and also some very brutal forces behind them. And so I want to say one thing about Trump uh, that is always horrifying me is that he's not only friends with Jeffrey Epstein, you know, who he referred to as a, a great guy who, you know, happens to like him young, you know, he likes young girls and Trump was cheering that on. Trump is friends with multiple pedophiles, most of whom were also engaged in sex trafficking and blackmail schemes where they would film, um, you know, powerful people raping and, and molesting these young girls. But this includes Alan Dershowitz, um, Tefi Arif, John on Casablanca, uh, you know, ran a modeling agency, George Nader, who was implicated in the Mueller probe, Roy Cohn, uh, who was accused of using sexual blackmail with uh, underage victims. Like, who the fuck is friends with five pedophiles or six, if you count Dershowitz? Like, ideally, you don't have any 
pedophile friends in your life? Like, what kind of person are you that you've got six of them? You know, you, a person who has no friends, like Donald Trump, you know, is famously insular. He doesn't have real relationships. His best friend was Roy Cohn, but he manages to rack up this level of engagement with known sex traffickers and pedophiles. Like, that's enormously disturbing, especially given his other comments about underage girls, whether about Ivanka or about Paris Hilton, she was 12 years old, and all the allegations, the many, many allegations of sexual assault that women have leveraged against him and, you know, his confession to, to grabbing women by the pussy. I, mean, I could go on and on. Like, how are people treating this man with any sort of, you know, respect and not making this a foremost concern? Um, you know, it's really frightening. And so, you know, one reason I think that this is, you know, happening, that there's this level of protection around him is because of the, the the fame of the other implicated parties. When you go after Trump, you potentially uh, expose all of them. And also this interesting angle, um, you know, that the Miami Herald didn't touch on as much, which is about Epstein's main associate who would go out and find these girls on the street uh, and, and bring them in, whose name is, uh, I'm probably mis, I'm not pronouncing this right, but um, Ghislaine Maxwell. Um, and she's a woman who was the daughter of Robert Maxwell. Uh, Robert Maxwell died in 1991 under somewhat mysterious circumstances. He either fell off a yacht or was killed after spending a lifetime as a Mossad operative and also as an extremely, extremely wealthy man working mostly in Great Britain as a publisher. And so one of the victims that the Miami Herald interviewed, um, Virginia Roberts, claims that Ghislaine Maxwell and Epstein forced her to have sex with Dershowitz um, and with Prince Andrew, another implicated party, among others. Um, that was the case that went to court. But, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm going down this road that no one seems to want to go down, but I don't know how we, not, we don't talk about it. This relationship between Robert Maxwell, the Mossad, and the Russian mafia is extremely disturbing. Uh, during Robert Maxwell's lifetime in the UK publishing industry, he worked on behalf of the Mossad. He allegedly censored pieces that were unflattering to Israel, um, like reports from whistleblowers that Israel had uh, procured nuclear weapons. But one of the most uh, disturbing things I read in a biography of Robert Maxwell is that he was a business partner of uh, the head of the Russian mafia, Simeon Mogilevich, uh, you know, who Andrea mentioned earlier in the show, and in the late 80s, early 90s before he died, helped him get an Israeli passport, which allowed him him to travel freely and launder money around the world. And, you know, Mihailovich is, is the guy who is, he's very close to Putin. Um, many people think that he's kind of pulling the strings there. He's implicated with the uh, Brooklyn, New York-based mafia, if you read the book Red Mafia. Um, but anyway, so so Maxwell is- And Trump Tower, New York City was basically a dorm for the Russian yes. mafia. Yes, exactly. And so you have the guy who, who made this possible. And he did that by getting him Israeli- citizenship. And so, you know, that is disturbing to me because there's a pattern here of people, um, you know, from the former Soviet Union basically abusing the right of return privilege uh, to operate as criminals under Israeli sanction, you know, with a passport or moving their money over there. Mogilevich did this decades ago. Uh, Roman Abramovich uh, did this very recently for his own financial benefit. And then you have other sort of familiar aspects from Netanyahu's Israel. You have the relationship between Kushner and Netanyahu, um, you know, both of whom are implicated in corruption schemes. The families go back decades. Uh, you know, Kushner's father was a criminal. The Kushner family has a lot of questionable investments in the West Bank. You have, of course, Black Cube um, and what they've been doing in terms of silencing sexual assault victims and helping the Trump campaign. The fact that they're doing both in tandem should not be ignored or their efforts to to uh, silence and intimidate people involved in the in, in Obama's 
Iran policy, which they were also doing. And then you have, uh, you know, people like Sheldon Adelson, who's the biggest donor to the GOP, but is really a one issue kind of guy. And his issue is Israel. Um, and his main goal is, you know, expansion uh, and, you know, basically brutality towards the Palestinians. And uh, perhaps most disturbingly, his desire to drop nukes on Iran, uh, which he's talked about many times. So, you know, this is a very frightening thing. Um, I think that it's clear that the Trump-Russia story is not just a Trump-Russia story. It's a Trump, Russia, Israel, Saudi Arabia, axis of autocrats throughout the world where you have, you know, the worst elements of every country brought in. And I think I need to emphasize here that, you know, the actions of Netanyahu or Black Cube or any other entity don't speak for Israel. This is not some sort of sweeping critique, but it is disturbing um, that so many ties were forged in a very corrupt manner and that these criminals may have, it may be less likely that they are punished uh, because the U.S. does have this extremely close relationship with Israel, you know, has historically been our ally, um, you know, very different than our historic relationship with Russia. And I think that, you know, big GOP donors whose focus uh, almost exclusively on Israel may make the GOP much more reluctant to pursue this international organized criminal body. Yeah, I mean, Israel, like the U.S. right now, is stuck under a corrupt government. They have Netanyahu, we have Trump. And I think, um, you know, it, it's, it's an, um, this this whole issue is very complicated for me. You know, my my sister's closest friend growing up uh, was an Israeli from Tel Aviv. And then her second childhood friend, you know, a, 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 a woman that she met actually in her first year in college, who's, who's also became a close family friend as a Palestinian from Ramallah. So here, this Palestinian from Ramallah and this Israeli from Tel Aviv, they became like sisters to me because these were my sister's two closest friends in the world. So we've seen this whole conflict through the eyes of them and their families. So it's a very hard issue for me to talk about. But so I do want to underline the point that you made just now, which is this isn't a, an issue of Israel itself. It's the corruption right now that is plaguing its government which the Israeli government itself is con is confronting, as there was just um, indictment. Uh, there was a recommendation to uh, by the Israeli. What was it? The um, an indictment charge against Netanyahu and his wife. So, and his wife for corruption charges. So, I think that there's a lot that we in the U.S. can learn from the Israeli opposition and how they're how they're organizing. Um, and how they're they're confronting their own uh, deep crisis of corruption. Before you. we before we move to Bush Senior, I want to give some more of the the Trump children their due. Uh, to your point about the human trafficking, one piece of that story that lends some credibility to those allegations is the fact that Ivanka Trump, who has her, she's young. She has her whole life ahead of her. She's young and rich and incredibly influential. She was at G twenty playing president you know like she had like they like she was just there to sort of you know collect her uh her resume bullet points so yes and i attended the g20 represented america there uh ivanka trump is gunning for the number one spot of coming back to the white house as a candidate as an as an elected president and uh, you know that whole thing with jared winning the highest honor in mexico that was probably something that, you know, was engineered behind the scenes, or if not, that was an expression of Mexico's relief of not having to deal with Trump during what would have been a very tense NAFTA renegotiation. So that's probably why Jared got that award from Mexico. And um, that's just, you know, a PR coup for Jared and Ivanka, who are deeply complicit in all of this. And so when Ivanka came out with an op-ed that the Washington Post let her publish, um, the same Washington Post that lost one of its writers, uh, murdered by Jared's friend, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. So, the, so they had an op-ed where uh, Ivanka Trump wrote that the Trump administration is taking bold action to combat the evil of human trafficking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is, you know, another example. Her father hangs out with pedophiles, including one that ran a human trafficking ring. Yeah, and, and her father signed her up for John Casablanca's modeling agency, when she was, which was a 
sex trafficking route. And again, this is not a theory of mine. This is, you know, this was hashed out in court and he was punished, which is a very questionable thing to do. I mean, that, that goes down a road that I'm not really uh, willing to go down, um, but it's disturbing. And yeah, you definitely see this proactive approach that the Trump administration has taken to the Epstein case, which comes out in a number of ways. Like first, you know, they threaten people, they threaten them with violence, they threaten them with uh, financial ruin, like with Gawker. They put out these, you know, bizarre conspiracy theories like Pizzagate or, um, you know, if you look at the canon hashtag um, or QAnon, uh, which I unfortunately do just to sort of stay on top of their propaganda tactics, you'll see a lot of talk about a plague of, of sex trafficking, which is honestly the fact that it exists. That's a well-founded claim. For example, this case. And it's been a strange feeling to sort of watch people who I, you know, I certainly think of as, um, you know, conspiracy theorists and unreliable, like, you know, Cernovich, for example, talking about how Epstein needs to be punished. Like, this may well be the only thing people in America agree on, and that's because it's an extremely upsetting and horrific issue. And then you see this other, you know, more typical kind of propaganda, which is Ivanka writing about it in the Washington Post. And, you know, yeah, it is horrifying um, that they would enable her to do that uh, after the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, which the Trump family is perfectly fine with, which, you know, Jared Kushner is, is good friends with MBS, who, who likely ordered the killing. And so you see them attacking it from all angles and really trying to tamp it down. And that's that's very frightening because, you know, we need justice in this case and we need to make sure that this doesn't happen again and that people engaging in this kind of activity now, you know, will be pursued and, you know, indicted and that people won't feel like they're free, uh, you know, to, to do these horrible things in the future. Because as we've seen, if there's one one lesson from the Trump administration is that when there's no consequences, these people, these criminals will only become emboldened and their acts will get worse and worse and worse. And when this lingers for decades, you end up with a vast intertwined international system that is extremely hard to untangle. And if people had been quicker in the 90s, um, you know, and if they had actually punished uh, Jeffrey Epstein, for example, instead of giving him a little cushy slap on the wrist and sealing all the documents, again, maybe Maybe we wouldn't be in this position because uh, real people are hurt here. This isn't about like getting vengeance on the Trumps. This is about making sure people are safe, making sure children are safe. And, you know, that should be something that, that should not be uh, a complicated demand, you know, something that we all as human beings can agree on is a worthy goal. And I hate that maybe that's where the unity of our country needs to, to start at, at such a point of tragedy. But maybe that's the way it's going to go. I don't know. We'll find out uh, December 4th, I think, this case is going to uh, be re-examined. So maybe by the time you hear this podcast, something will have developed. Before we take a break, I just want to give you a quick update. On a recent Swamp Watch, we exposed the shocking plea deal that Labor Secretary Alex Acosta offered billionaire hedge fund manager and serial pedophile Jeffrey Epstein. This week, the Justice Department Inspector General urged Congress to remove a legal provision that actually prevents the department from investigating its own lawyers, in this case, Alex Acosta, who was U.S. attorney in charge of the Epstein case. Now, the House has unanimously passed a bill to fix the problem, and it must now be taken up by the Senate. So I hope you'll join me in calling for senators in both parties to pass this bill so the inspector general can investigate Acosta's disgraceful leniency for that pedophile monster, Jeffrey Epstein. Well, a federal judge in Florida has ruled prosecutors, including current Labor Secretary Alex Acosta, violated federal law when they reached a plea agreement in 2007 with financier and sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. The judge says they also failed to inform dozens of his victims. 